Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everyone, tonight. What a beautiful service we've had so far. I'll tell you the scripture I'm going to be starting with, if you want to turn there. And uh, we'll be starting with Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And as you turn there, I'd like to take this moment to give honor to a few different people. And the first is our church leadership. So thankful to have a pastor and a bishop and families. We are very, very fortunate here at South Flint. We've got the best of the best. Give honor to them, to the ministers who are on the platform and who labor in the ministry throughout the course of the week. And finally, I want to give honor to one last group. I haven't done it in a while, and that's to you, the saints of South Flint Tabernacle. I was thinking the other day about the first time I ever preached, and it probably was a train wreck. To be honest, it was probably a complete nightmare. But when I got on Facebook later that night, there was a message on my wall from Sister Linda Bertram, and it said, you did a fantastic job. I'm so proud of you. And I thought that, that encouragement has stuck with me over all of these years. So thank you for each and every time that you encourage each other, encourage us. It means something. I give honor to you. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6 says this. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Amen. You may be seated. And we're talking here about consecrating our eyes. Now, the word generally translated as consecrate in the Old Testament, sometimes also called sanctified or sanctification, has two contextual meanings. The first meaning is to separate ourselves from this world or to be sanctified or to be holy in our conduct. It is to be a set-apart people. That is one meaning of the word consecration. The second contextual use of the word consecration is this. And it's used with the same frequency as being set apart. And that is to come into an intimate relationship with the Lord. They are equally important. It is one thing to set apart and to be uh, a holy and sanctified people, but it's equally important to come into a strong, intimate, holy connection with the King of Kings. Now notice in Exodus... It's very clear. He says an intimate relationship is a byproduct of obedience. He said if, if you obey and if you keep his covenant, in other words, if you sanctify yourself and if you act holy and if you separate yourself from the things of this world, then. So if then, then you shall be his possession. Then you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. John elaborates on this further in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Verse 15 says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love this world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and our possessions. In other words, if you love this world, if you love the things of this world, you do not have intimacy with the Father. Why is that? He says why. Because the world offers physical pleasure. He said because the world creates in us a craving for all of the things that we behold. The world generates within us a pride for all that we have accomplished or what we have possessed. How do we overcome this? We must consecrate our eyes. I want you to imagine for a moment a world, this is a crazy thought, but think about it for a moment, a world where you had been born blind. You had never seen the opposite gender. You had never beheld the handsomeness of a man or the beauty of a woman. You had never seen riches. You'd never seen possessions or sleek, shiny cars. You'd never beheld the leather seats in a car. 
What difference would it make then if you were to ride in a Lexus or a $500 car you bought off Marketplace? What difference would it make if you lived in a palace of a home with the most beautiful landscaping, brick face, columns, beauty, or a simple apartment with a worn wooden door? What difference would the external, external beauty of a woman or a handsome man make if you never beheld it? The inner beauty would truly then have a chance to shine. You would fall in love with the consecration of the person. You would fall in love with the holiness of a person as opposed to what you're looking at. It is the eyes that lead us into the temptation and the love of this world. And for us to escape this world, we must consecrate our eyes and keep them holy unto the Lord. Well, if we're going to keep them set apart, what, what do we need to do then? Well, we need to be careful of what we watch on social media, on Netflix, on the Internet. That's the battleground of our eyes. It's in the places when we're in the private moments of our home or with our phone. This is the battleground for our eyes. Job said that he made a covenant with his eyes that he would never lust after a woman. He had to make an agreement with his eyes that he would no longer be lustful. Why is that? Because he understood that his eyes were how he could sanctify himself with the Lord. Now be thoughtful of how we view things and what we don't have. What do you feel when you behold a nice home or car or clothes? That's equally a battleground for us to sanctify ourselves. If we look across the way and we look, oh, my brother has this beautiful car. I envy that. I'm jealous of that. I want that. We need to sanctify the things that we see. However, as noted at the introduction, consecration is not simply abstaining from sin, but consecration is also connecting and having an intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's possible to look at things that are not sinful and yet take us away from this int intimacy with God. You can watch football all day long, and it's not sinful, but does it draw you into a relationship with God? It does not. You can, you can easily, I don't have TikTok, but I know that you can scroll on TikTok for a long period of time. Now, some of it could be sinful, but probably a lot of it's not. Maybe gardening on TikTok, right? You like, or you like watching cooking videos on TikTok. Not sinful, but how quickly does it drain your time? Time that you could be consecrating yourself, lifting up your eyes to God, saying, Lord, I want to have intimacy and a closer relationship with you. And at the end of the day, we reach our, our time limit. It's time to close our eyes. And then we say, Lord, where did the time go today? I had no time to pray. I had no time to develop intimacy. It's because we didn't consecrate our eyes. We can drown out our consciousness with technology, history books, the TV show, how it's made, cooking shows, and none of it is inherently bad. And yet, it doesn't lead us to consecration. In fact, you might even make the argument that while it's not sin, it leads you away from consecration, dulling your time, stealing your time, and leaving you with no intimacy with God at all. So how do we get to intimacy with God? Well, instead, we must spend our time doing this, reading the Word of God. It's one way to get intimate with the Lord. It's to consecrate your eyes, and instead of putting worldly things in front of them, put in front of them the things of God. Put in front of them the Word of God. We can see a perfect model of this in Luke chapter 2. It recounts a 12-year-old Jesus hanging out in the temple, or in modern-day terms, he was hanging out in church. And he was discussing the Word of God. And he was looking and hanging around with the people of God. That was the perfect model for us to think about sanctifying our eyes in loving the things that God loves. I'm going to leave you with a final scripture. And it's one, frankly, that haunts me in some ways, but I probably think of it every single day. It's my own internal litmus test I ask myself. It's Jesus speaking uh, in Matthew chapter 7, he says in verse 21, 
He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. This is where it gets a little scary right here. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? These are people that understand Jesus' name. These are Christians. This is the church. He's not talking to people out of church. He's talking to people in the church. He said, didn't we do prophecy in your name? And, and didn't we in your name cast out demons? We were, we were going to the lost and we were casting out demons. We did, and didn't we do many great works in your name? Didn't we do many miracles? And Jesus said, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. Now I asked myself once, how could that be? That people are harnessing the power on the, of the name of Jesus and they're doing great works for the kingdom of God and yet they get to the end and they find out that instead they're going to be turned away and cast aside. And I feel like the Lord answered me and said, you know, if a preacher isn't acting right privately and gets up to preach, were I to make his words fall flat and were I to make it so he could never deliver the gospel, the people who are harmed are the people who would be receiving the word. I'll still use him. I'll still use that preacher to put the word of God out. I'll still use that praise singer to sing praise and worship. But don't you ever mistake you're being used of God for consecration. You can work in God all day long. You can sing the best songs. You can preach the word, the best message. But you can still reach that judgment seat and have him say, depart from me because you weren't consecrated. You never looked up. You never set your eyes on me. You never gave yourself to me fully. You didn't consecrate yourself. And so I say to you, look up. Consecrate your eyes. Look to the Lord. Set your sights on him. A life lived in consecration with eyes dedicated to the Lord is the one that will get there and hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you feel a call to consecrate your eyes, let's take a moment and just pray. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help me to have consecrated eyes. In Jesus' name, praise God. Praise God. Wonderful message by Brother Noe there. Praise God. Wonderful message. Amen. Thank you, Pastor and Bishop, for this opportunity to participate in the service this evening. Uh, I give all of you honor today. I love you very much. I think about you often, and I pray for you. I pray for blessings upon your family. And man, I pray for the ministers up here. I'm very thankful and honored to serve with you. And I give honor also to uh, my wife, Julie, Dominic, Jalen, Brooklyn, Bella, and my mother. I love my mother very much. She's my number one fan. <laughs> Praise God. I'm talking tonight about consecrating our ears just for a couple of minutes. If you could pull up John 10, and this is two verses. Please pay attention to, to these words here. This is Jesus talking. Jesus said, my sheep... They hear or listen to my voice, and I know them. Brother Noe just ended with Jesus telling a few people, I never knew you. Jesus said, those who listen to my voice, they have consecrated ears. I know them, and they follow me. Next verse. And I give unto them who? Those who have a consecrated ear to God, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. Amen. You can be seated. The consecration of our ears. Consecrating our ears is twofold. First of all, it's a separation away from all of the voices that are contrary to the voice of God. Everything that is contrary to the spirit of God, everything that is contrary to the kingdom of God, it's a pulling away from that. We've got to be careful who we're listening to, careful what we're listening to, careful what we're thinking about. We've got to guard, guard our ears. So it's a separation away from everything that is not like God. Not, whoever doesn't talk like God and they don't sound like the truth, 
and it doesn't say the things that God says, we've got to pull away from those things. And we've got to dedicate and commit ourselves unto his voice. Unto his voice when he's talking to us in prayer. When we're pulling away and getting away from the noise of this world and all of the voices and the talking heads of this world. All of the religious leaders and the political leaders, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, whatever you listen to, we've got to turn it off on a daily basis and get alone with God. We have got to know and be familiar with the voice of God. Consecrating our ears is so important. Moses, when he was anointing and consecrating the first high priest, who was Aaron, he took a bull and he, and he sacrificed it. And he had the blood and he put it all over the, the temple. And then he took the blood and he put it on three parts of Aaron's body. He put it on the big toe of his right foot so that Aaron would always walk straight and upright before God. And he took some more of that blood and he put it on the thumb of his right hand so that Aaron would be faithful in his service to God as a temporary mediator between God and man. And lastly, he took some more blood and he put it on the right ear of Aaron so that Aaron would always listen to the voice of God. So that he would always be intent on what do you want to say to me, God? More so than his own preferences. More so than his own opinions. More so than the opinions and the beliefs and the grumblings of the people. He wanted the high priest to have the ear and the mouth of God in his ear. Consecrating our ears is no small matter. It's not a detail here. Consecration is of utmost importance. We have got to hear the voice of God. We have got to be familiar with the voice of God. We've got to have ears consecrated to him. Consecrated ears is not just a detail. His voice is the lighthouse dark in the night. His voice is like that star that the wise men were following, trying to find the king. His voice is the sound in the night when the waves are crashing and the wind is blowing. We can still hear the voice of God. The Bible, with all of its history and all of its poetry and all of its prophecies and promises, it starts out by telling us two things. It starts out telling us that God created everything. And it starts out telling us how God created everything. And it was the voice of God. And when the Bible talks about creation, and uh, it doesn't just mean you and me and planet Earth. It is, as Colossians 1 and 16 puts it, that it was the voice of God that created everything in the heavens and the heavenly realms. And it was the voice of God that created everything in the earth. It was the voice of God that created everything visible, and it was the voice of God that created everything that is invisible. It was the voice of God that created every throne, and it was the voice of God that created every principality that would ever be. It was the voice of God that created all dominion, and it was the voice of God that created all power, which means if we have an ear consecrated to his voice, that means he has every answer that we might need right in his word. Everything that exists exists within the framework of his word. That's why we've got to have consecrated ears to hear what the king says, to hear what the king says. And since he created everything, that means everything is subject to his voice. Just like everything in a book is subject to the author. And every piece of clay is subject to the potter. Everything that exists is subject to the voice of the master. We've got to consecrate our ears to his voice. Having ears that are dedicated to God and that can hear the sound of the voice of God, will overcome even everything that we see or feel. Anything that we see or feel, nothing, even if we see nothing and it looks bad, that does not limit the voice of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 is talking about the world. And it says three things about the world. It says that it was without form, and it was void, and it was covered in darkness. Now, these don't sound too bad, and we skip over it most of the time. But I'm going to give you the definitions of the Hebrew that this was translated from. The word without form is the word tohu. And tohu means a worthless place that is filled with confusion. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever felt worthless? 
might you ever feel worthless or have confusion in your life? It says that the word or the world, the earth was filled with a uh, sense of uh, worthlessness and confusion. Void comes from the word vohu, and it means not only emptiness, but emptiness such that it is indistinguishable ruin indistinguishable, where you can't even tell right from wrong. You can't tell up from down, east from west. It was uh, empty. The word darkness doesn't just mean somebody forgot to flip the light switch. That word koshek means death and misery, sorrow, ignorance, and pain. But in the middle of all of the worthlessness, in the middle of the void, in the middle of the emptiness, when you couldn't see anything good, there was blackness. When you couldn't feel anything good, there was one thing that pierced through that feeling of worthlessness. One thing that pierced through that void, that emptiness, that darkness, and it's in the next verse. It says, and God said, and it was the voice of God when he said, let there be light. And that place of worthlessness became a place of great worth and value. And that place that was empty became filled with the glory of God. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever just got a word from God and it met you where you were? It was the voice of God that said, let there be light. And the place that was dark was filled with his light. And the sorrow was given peace. The Bible even says that that light is the light that shined to the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. And that's why now it says in Isaiah 6 that the whole earth now is filled with his glory. It was that same voice. It was that same voice of God thousands of years later that met another place of darkness and misery and chaos. Except this time, there was a pair. All there was, the only difference was there were a pair of consecrated ears that were lying in a grave. The man didn't even have life. All he had was a pair of ears that had been consecrated to God while he was living. And that same spirit of God, this time, instead of saying, let there be light, it said, Lazarus, come forth. And that same voice that shined in the darkness and and shined in that place of worthlessness passed through the tomb and passed through death. Not even death could prevent the voice of God. Not even sorrow and misery could prevent that voice of God that shined through. Nothing can stop the voice of God when you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Hallelujah. Help me, Lord, to have consecrated ears, not to listen to my own heart or opinions, but that will listen to your voice. Praise God. Praise God. Nothing can stop the voice of God when there is an ear that is willing to hear what thus saith the Lord. Not even death. Praise God. In, in closing, I just, I wonder, is it possible that any of us might be going through something or will be going through something that would be alleviated simply with a consecrated ear? Simply with an ear that God could talk to. Is it possible that maybe the problem we have in our life isn't what we think it is? But maybe we've been listening some, to something that was contrary to the will of God. Maybe we've been having one ear consecrated to God and one ear consecrated to whatever else we want to listen to. I challenge us tonight to consecrate our ears, to give them 100% to hear what the Spirit is saying. Bless you very much in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God some thanks for the word that we just heard. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you, Lord, for your word tonight, Jesus. Amen, amen. I'm so thankful for the word that we've already heard. And I could probably just step away from here and we could just end it right now. But uh, I do have an do have assignment and do have a word from the Lord. But first of all, I want to give honor to Bishop pastor thank you tonight i give honor to the first family as well thankful for our godly leadership and the example that they set for us to follow and i really feel like we are blessed with the best tonight we really are and i'm thankful for this opportunity to bring the word of the lord this evening i give honor to my wife i'm so thankful for her love and support and she is truly a blessing to me and i give honor to all of you to the fellow ministry here tonight 
So thankful to be a part of this church. Thankful to be a part of God's kingdom tonight. And I want to read two verses tonight at the onset here. And the first one is Psalms chapter 19, verse 14. And the second one is Proverbs 18 and verse 21, the first part of that verse. And we're just simply going to be talking about the consecration of our mouth here for the next few moments. Psalms 19 and 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And then Proverbs 18, 21, the first part of that says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. For the next few moments, we're going to talk about consecrating our mouth. And you may be seated here. And, and consecration, the definition's been given, but in case you already forgot it, it's simply making the process of making something sacred, to set apart for a sacred pers- uh, purpose. And I believe that one of the most important things that we have to consecrate Not that we choose, it's not really an option, but one of the most important things that we have to learn to consecrate is our mouth. Because you see, out of our mouths come these noises. Anybody know what those noises are? They're called words. And and the words that come out of our mouth, they're more than just sounds that that, that the air, you know, we, we shape it with our mouth and that air passes through our vocal cords, and these, these, this air, it forms words. And, but the words that we speak, they have power. Proverbs 18, 21, death and, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I was hoping Brother Bird would get out of my notes here for a few moments. But the Word of God tells us that the first time that words are recorded was during creation. And that's when God spoke everything that we see, all of creation, all of the visible and the invisible things were created by His spoken words. God spoke it all to, into existence just by the power of words. He said, let it be, and out of nothing there it was. And while we can't speak things into existence the way that He can in the natural The Word of God tells us that the words that we speak, they have power. And out of all creation, think about this, out of all creation, humans are the only ones that have the ability to communicate through the spoken word. And you see, here's why our words are so powerful, because our words convey a message and they have impact on the lives of that are that of others that are around us those that hear the words that we speak whether we realize it or not they are affecting somebody every one of us here in this room we are speaking a message when we open our mouth and we speak and i want to ask you this question tonight what message is coming out of your mouth you don't have to answer that but just think about that what message are you speaking when you open your mouth. Peter, on the night that he, w- he betrayed Jesus, was identified. How was he identified? By his speech. By the words that came out of his mouth. They said, I know you are a follower of Jesus. And we know that you follow him. And he said, no, I'm not a follower. I don't know the man. And they said, oh, yes, you are. We can tell by the way that you talk. And you know what? The same thing should be said about every Holy Ghost-filled child of God. The world should be able to look at us and say, there goes a true Christian. There goes a true child of God. Let me ask you, can the world around you identify you by the speech, by the words that you say? And you see, this is why it's so important here tonight that we understand that we need to consecrate our mouth and that the words that we speak, that they have the right effect on others around us and that they send and portray the right message. The Apostle James dealt with a member of the body that is found in our mouth. And this is a big subject. I don't have time to go into all of it. James chapter 3, it talks about the power of the tongue. And oh my, 
I don't have time. Like I said, I don't have time to read it all, but I encourage you, read James chapter 3, and you will understand the power of that little member that is inside of your mouth. But he talks about how a, ho a horse, he's much more powerful than a man. But you know what? He is, he is controlled by a little piece of metal. It's called a bit, and it is placed in the mouth of that horse. And that bit makes that horse goes wherever, whoever holds the reins controls the direction of that horse. And he also describes how a massive ship is controlled by the rudder, which in comparison to the ship is much smaller inside. He who commands the rudder determines the direction of the ship. And then he gets to the heart of the matter, the tongue. It is a small part of the body, but it has power, listen, of life and death. James chapter 3, verses 5 through 12, it reads this way from the message translation. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish, look at this, nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do the same thing. It can do just that. By our speech, we turn ruin. We can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. Listen, look at this. You can tame a tiger. Think about how powerful a tiger is. But you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild. It's a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God our Father. And with the same tongues, we curse the very men and women that he made in his image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. A spring doesn't gush water one day and then brackish the next, does it? Apple trees don't bear strawberries, do they? Raspberry bushes don't bear apples, do they? You're not going to dip into a polluted mud hole and get a cup, cup of clear, cool water, are you? Powerful, powerful passage of Scripture. And these words show the effects that, these verses show the effects that words that come out of our mouth have on others and on situations that are around us. But I feel to say this here tonight, that even though the words that we speak that come from our mouth, uh, communication has changed a lot. And, and you know, there's a lot, a majority of communication is through text, through social media. And I want to tell you, the words that you type on your phone, the words that you type on your computer can have the same effect that the words that come out of your mouth have. If you post something negative and vent your frustration and feelings over social media, you might as well have said it with your mouth. We can't justify ourselves by saying, well, I didn't say it. I just typed it. It's the same thing. The words that you type portray, they speak a message that we are sending and have power to positively or negatively affect a person or situation just as words that are spoken from our mouth. Proverbs 18, 21, the first part of that verse says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. The words that we speak to those around us and even to ourselves have the power to build up or to tear down. So I ask you here tonight, are the words that we are speaking bringing life or are they bringing death? Are they building up or are they tearing down? Are they bringing encouragement or are they full of negativity and discouragement? Are the words that we are speaking filled with love or are they filled with hate, with bitterness or with blessing, with victory or defeat? And I just want to tell somebody right now, somebody is feeling defeated in this house, but you are victorious through Jesus Christ. The enemy may have knocked you down this week, but let me tell you something, you can get back up. You are an overcomer here tonight, in Jesus' name. And we need to make sure that the words that we are speaking 
are having the right effect on others around us. When we see a brother or sister struggling or going through a hard time, we should be ready to have words of encouragement. We should be able to speak a word of faith over their situation. You can do it. You can get back up. You can carry on. God is with you. God is on your side. You are more than an overcomer. You see, when our mouths are consecrated, then it won't be hard to speak the right way. We will speak truth. That means we will share this gospel message to those in the community. We will speak encouragement. You're going to make it. God has great things in store for you. You will speak faith. I haven't seen my prayer answered, but I believe that God is still able to answer it. I haven't received my healing yet, but I know that God is still able to heal me. I haven't seen my lost family members say, but God is still going to do it. I truly believe that one of the keys to unlocking unlimited power is by consecrating our mouths and making sure the words that we say are acceptable to Him. This is my prayer tonight. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in Thy sight. Oh Lord, my strength. In my Redeemer, Lord, I want the words that I say to be acceptable in your sight. I want to speak life and not death. I want to build up others and not to tear down. I want my words to be pleasing to you. And if that's your prayer tonight, why don't you lift up your hands? Why don't you reach out to him right now? Why don't you consecrate yourself to him? God, I love you today, Jesus.